Welcome to the last regular talk of the weekend in this room. Uh, I can see there are a couple of people coming up, so I'll talk for, for a little bit longer. Um, this is the last intro I'll do, I promise. Uh, I'll be off the stage. Right, we better get started then. The last people are wandering in now. Uh, Leonardo is going to talk to us about clean architecture in Python. He's a software engineer at a, uh, in the film industry, which I think is really cool, a company called We Got Pop, and uh, author of a book uh, of the same name. Now, I'm told by many authors that uh, it doesn't pay that great. So if we can listen to the talk and appreciate the advice, maybe we can go out and buy the book as well. Uh, he didn't pay me to say that, I promise. Um, so with that, over to Leonardo. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I am the third Italian in a row in this room, and I dare to say this is statistically significant, right? <laughs> um, so about me, I just got an amazing introduction. I'm a software developer and a blogger, and uh, I'm the author of a book uh, named Clean Architectures in Python. Let me start with a question. What is the definition of architecture? And Vitruvius, who was a Roman architect, first century, in his book, The Architectura, speaks about firmitas utilitas venustas, which in modern English is durability, utility, and beauty. So he says that architecture deals with something that should uh, last the um, test of time, stand the test of time, sorry, um, be useful, and be beautiful. When it comes to software architecture, so software uh, development, the dictionary gave me an interesting definition. Software architecture is the art and science in which the components of a computer system are organized and integrated. So first of all, art and science. How many of you consider themselves artists? Many consider themselves engineers, right? But artists? Interesting. The second thing is organization and integration. So architecture, software architecture, has to deal with where components of your system are and how data flows between these components. Now that we know, superficially at least, what architecture is, the second question is, do we need an architecture? And the very short answer is, yes, I don't have that much time, but the main point, my, my point is, if you don't decide anything about your architecture, someone will decide for you, typically your framework. Many of you, if you create uh, web applications or mobile applications, use frameworks, right? The framework enforces an, an architecture. Unfortunately, the framework is just part of the system. So no, de no decision is already a decision. Um, the third question is, what is the meaning of clean? I guess it's very easy to understand what unclean is, this. I don't want to work in such an environment because I don't know which cable I have to pull. It's too risky. While in a clean environment, you know where things are, you know why components are there, and you know what something is. Okay. What is the clean architecture? This. So the clean architecture is a layered architecture. So it's a way to create systems based on layers. Here we have three, well, four layers. Let me spend a couple of minutes on this slide. Um, layered ar architecture means that when you create something in your system, you are not free to put it where you want. Uh, components are forced to live in a certain layer according to their nature. Here we have entities, use cases, and external systems, plus a half layer, which is called gateways. The important thing in a layered ar architecture like this is that whatever lives in an internal layer, like for example entities, doesn't know anything about what lives in outer layers. 
I will come up with an example in a second. But it's important to understand that if you create, for example, a Python class in the entities layer, you are not allowed to name, to call, any class that has been created in an outer layer. The golden rule of the clean architecture is that external layers talk to uh, internal layers through simple structures. Simple structures are, um, for example, structures defined by the language, lists, dictionaries, or structures defined in an internal layer, like entities. And you talk outwards through interfaces. Why? Because you are not allowed, as I said, to call a specific class that has been defined outside. You don't know about it. So you have to go through an interface. We don't have in Python specific construction, uh, construct for um, interfaces, like for example in Java, but we can still use interfaces. So this is my example. Um, let's say we are dealing with uh, a very simple uh, model, an object. I am creating a clone of eBay, for example. Okay? In the entities layer, there is a class object. As you can see, this is not a model like, for example, Django models. This is a very simple class. It might be a data class. It might have um, methods, but it's definitely not connected with a database. Okay, this is something new, probably. My use case is retrieve a list of objects. Okay, so for example, I have um, a cart, I have a, I don't know, a filtering, someone is searching for an object. So my use case lives in the use case layer, use cases layer, and the use case is a simple class. I can instantiate it and execute it. The only thing you can do with a use case is to execute it. It's very, very simple. So I call execute. In 2019, we are probably talking about a web application, but it could be a mobile application. It could be a command line interface. I'm just giving you an example. If this is a web application, I can go with Flask, for example, and create an endpoint like this. Cool. So the task of the web framework is that of receiving HTTP um, requests and translating these requests, extracting the parameters, like the query string parameters, for example, and calling the use case. So the HTTP request becomes a call with some parameters. Then we have a repository, because we need to extract data from somewhere. In this case, for example, a database. Again, it could be something different. Let's say a database. The database, as you see, lives in the external system layer. Why? Because I don't want to be coupled with the database. I just want to say there's a database somewhere, something that can provide data. But if I want to access the database, I need an interface. And the interface is specific for my business. It's not an interface that maps the whole database to Python, for example, but it's a specific interface. The interface maps what the database returns in terms of a specific language into simple structures and entities again. As you can see here, there's an example, very brief, um, example of an um, interface towards Postgres. I expose one method, which is list, that accepts some filters. I have a query that depends on these filters, and I am returning, returning some entities. So the use case has to receive also the repository interface. As you see, I added the dictionary plus database interface. Because this is dependency inversion, the use case cannot call the interface directly, cannot name it, because the use case doesn't know the class is there. So I have to pass the instance to the use case. As you can see here, I initialize the repository then I call the use case passing the repository instance, and then I call the use case, the execution, execute method. Now, the use case calls the repository interface. So in, inside the, the use case, what happens is that the use case has to uh, interact with the database somehow, interacts with the interface, 
extracts data and applies the business logic. This is the core of your application because when you create an application, the core of it is the business, are the business rules. You shouldn't be uh, concerned with, or oh, the user clicks a button on the graphical user interface. Fine, but what happens? The user is deleting a message. Okay, this is the business case. This is the this business use case. So what happens in the use case is that we run the business logic and then we return a result. Where does the result go? The result goes back to the external system that called the use case, in this case, the web framework. So here you see I uh, collect the result of execute in a result variable. And at, at this point, the web framework is in charge of uh, converting this response, which might be entities, for example, or again, simple structures, into an HTTP response. So as you can see from this uh, picture, I am um, applying the separation of concerns. Okay, so ev every uh, actor in this system is dealing with a specific thing. So the web framework is dealing with HTTP um, requests and responses. The use case is dealing with some parameters and some data. The database interface is dealing with the database. Advantages of this architecture are uh, many. There are many advantages. Two of them that I want to mention are testability and um, ease of change, if you want, uh, easily, easily changed. So the testability is this. Uh, testing the components of this system is very easy. Because if I want to test the use case, as you, if you see, if you look at this class, testing it is very simple because I just need to pass a dictionary and a mock of the repository interface, and I have to test that the um, use case gives me back the correct entities and an interface call. It's a very simple test, five lines. Testing the HTTP endpoint is very simple. Again, I need an HTTP request, some mocks for the use case for the repository, and then I have to test the outputs. My point is I don't need to instantiate a database, for example. If you are used to Django, just to name one framework, very good framework, by the way, when you test your models, you have to have a database running, not here. When do you need a database? When you test the, the repository interface, obviously. Is Matt Wozinski here? No. He lives there, you know. He, he's dealing with uh, database interfaces. So in this case, you need an integration test. So here you need the real database running, and here you need to, for example, run, uh, spin up Docker images, but these are slow tests, one of the three. Now that I give you a very simple example, uh, I want to address a couple of uh, other questions. So is this the definitive architecture? I don't think so. So this is a very good architecture. I really, really suggest um, using it. But this is not... Uh, not the best architecture, because I believe there is no one, no, not a single solution to every problem. So one of the problems of the clean architecture is that it's a layered architecture. There are a lot of layers. I showed you the minimum amount of layers, four, but you might have more. A layers means data transformation, because as you see, you know, something comes out of the database, becomes a simple structure, goes into the use case, then becomes another structure, then becomes a HTTP response, blah, blah, blah. So you have all this data transformation. This uh, means time. This means that you are affecting the performances of your system. So not every system can be, cr can be created with a clean architecture. It's up to you to understand this. It's not a panacea. And the second question is, is it possible to migrate an existing system towards the clean architecture? And my advice here is to uh, detach simple uh, cases, for example, endpoints. If you are dealing with a web application, you might start with simple endpoints, for example, the login endpoints, for example, some data instructions, and 
implement them in a different system created from scratch with a clean architecture. Don't try to move your whole Django application towards the clean architecture in one go. It doesn't work. Don't do it. I have a lot of time. OK, fine. Um, so there are. Um, so there is one thing I want to say that is not in the slides, but uh, there are many books about domain-driven domain design, about clean architectures. You might, yes, thank you. Uh, you might argue these books come from the Java community. Okay, many people writing books about these subjects come from the Java community, and we say many bad things about the Java community. Uh, definitely, the language is not the best one around probably, at least. But the Java community has been addressing these issues for the last 30 years. So we definitely have something to learn from those people. And I definitely uh, believe we should get in touch with them. Uh, Harry Percival and Bob Gregory are about to write a book with O'Reilly called, uh, well, the working title is Pythonic Application Architecture Patterns. The definite title will be different. Um, or really agreed to publish it with an open source license, so you can find it on GitHub. You can already um, read it. You can, you know, um, send pull requests or something if you uh, believe you can contribute to it. And there is already a book about clean architectures in Python. I published it uh, last Christmas. It's available for free, so you are uh, kindly invited to go and download it and read it. I'm really, really uh, looking forward to discussing with people uh, architectural problems. Because my point today here is to uh, start again a discussion about architectures. I believe we have incredible frameworks in the Python community. One is Django, for example. It's a very, very, really, really a good product. But we are not addressing some of the problems like the architectural problems, we are delegating the framework. So we should start discussing again these things. Um, I am yeah, seven minutes early, so maybe the time for questions if you want. Thanks. Um, you, I, I, I love that architecture. I used to work with that sort of architecture. Now I work with Django and it makes me a bit sad inside. You mentioned Django and you mentioned walking to a new way of doing things. Is there any advice that you can give me to, to make Django, <laughs> to mold it into a more clean architecture? Okay, uh, yeah, it's, with Django it's hard because Django, well, for starters because it's a, it's a very good framework but tries to do too much for me. So, for example, Django models are tightly connected with the database. So it's difficult to work with Django and models that are not connected with the database. My point is, generally speaking, you can always wrap things and trace a boundary. So you might, as I said, one thing that you can say, one thing you can do is to say, okay, I isolate part of my system, some endpoints, for example, if you are working with Django, it's a web application, you know. So isolating some part of it and say, okay, I move towards something different. Maybe with the same database. You, if you create a database interface that works with Django, with what Django created, you can deal with it. Um, but yes, definitely is what I was saying before. Don't try to bend Django, the whole structure that you created with Django towards the clean architecture. You should try to you know, move Django to its part of the system. So dealing with HTTP requests. Probably Django is really hard. I, I, select, I, I chose Flask in my example exactly because it's from the ground up. It's, it's simpler, you know. Um, but yes, I don't want I don't want this uh, discussion, this talk to be like you know clean architecture versus Django. The, my, my point is where I mention the web framework, uh, I mean a web framework. So whatever, Django can be there. But definitely, if Django wants to deal with the database, no, not in this architecture. I hope I answered. Oh, got one over. Yeah. Two. 
Hi, thank, thank you for your, for your talk. You're welcome. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, many model systems are moving to, uh, for example, microservice-based architecture, uh, where th there are several components. And I imagine each of the components having this general shape. But can something like this be used to design the architecture on a larger scale, or how different components connect to each other? Or what kind of patterns do you ambition that are relevant at that scale? Oh, that's interesting. Um, OK, complex question. Um, OK, sh short answer. We, we might discuss it later. Uh, short answer is, I believe the power, the, the main point of the clean architecture is uh, layering, so separating concerns. OK, so this is the point of microservices as well. So when you create microservices, it's a buzzword nowadays, you know, but why do we want microservices? We were discussing with someone uh, at lunch, you know, about monolithic architectures. What's the definition of monolithic? A microservice is monolithic. If you trace a boundary around the, the microservice, it's a monolith. So the point is, this, it depends on what you are doing. So what is the definition of microservice? What, what um, parts of your system should you decouple from others? Not everything, you know? And you will have coupling. So I know I'm not giving you a, like a straight answer, but my point is the clean architecture is a software architecture, but generally speaking is about putting components in the right layer and enabling the communication between them uh, enforcing some rules, which is the um, golden rule, like uh, sm small, um, simple structures and interfaces. But yeah, we can discuss about it, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I'm sort of going back to your opening slide and wondering if perhaps the work of Clis Christopher Alexander, who inspired the design at patents people, yes. might be relevant here. Definitely. Uh, I didn't mention it because I thought I didn't have time, but uh, what you are saying is that the design pattern, which is a very important book in our, um, in our job, has been, has been inspired by architectural concerns. I didn't read the, the book, the, the book Alexander wrote, so I, don't, I cannot uh, answer directly. <laughs> Uh, I believe the, the, main, the main thing I, I learned from Alexander uh, not having read the book is he observed something that happened in his job, that happened in his community, and he tried to formalize this. So we shouldn't be uh, scared of saying this is what happens in when we create web applications, for example. This is what happens when I deal with databases. This is what happens when I create big systems. And trying to, instead of avoiding things or masking uh, you know, uh, problems, addressing them. This is what I can say, but again, it's a limited exp experience with that book, Alexander's book. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll draw questions to a close. Thank you.